Welcome to the coming apocalypse. Evangelist and pastor Paul Bagley will take you on a journey into the end times prophecy. He'll examine current world events and explain how they relate to the end times. For decades, Pastor Bagley has provided people all over the world with an understanding of today's world events from a biblical perspective. Now here's your host, Pastor Paul Bagley. Welcome to the coming apocalypse. I'm Pastor Paul Begley. We've got a great broadcast for you, some real good teaching that I think needs updated. Now, I know a lot of you have heard of the two witnesses, but have you heard of the two olive trees and the two prophets? Do you understand? God speaks both in the Old Testament and the New in preparation for what's yet to come, the prophecies of God. Nothing new under the sun that hasn't already been done. God uses his power and his word and his anointing to carry forth, to bring forth the prophetic revelation of Jesus Christ. The apocalypse is upon us. And so today we're going to go back and revisit the two witnesses by looking at it from the ideal, from the biblical perspective of the two olive trees. I'll be right back in just a moment. Every year we see records for hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires, volcanoes, and floods. Is Earth spiraling toward human extinction? extinction. Our Climate Chaos webinar Climate examines chaos. all these alarming trends, why they're increasing, and what we can do about them. Plus, Paul Begley explains their end time significance. Now you can have the entire Climate Chaos webinar on DVD so you can explore the facts in more detail. Go to paulbegleyprophecy.com to order Climate Chaos on Climate DVD. Chaos. All right, all right, the two olive trees, the two witnesses, the two prophets, it's in the Bible. And it's all bringing about God's anointing and actually some different dispensations of time too. Okay, let's check this out. If you go with me to Zechariah, I know we're going to be in Revelation 11. I know we're going to be there. But before you can get to Revelation 11, you got to go to Zechariah. And you got to understand the concept of the two olive trees. The Bible says in Zechariah 4, and an angel that talked with me. So this is a vision. Zechariah is getting a vision, very spiritual. He says, and the angel that talked with me came again and wake me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. And he said unto me, what seest thou? And I said, I have looked and behold a candlestick all of gold, and folks, that would be the menorah, okay, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, the other upon the left side thereof. This is very important. So what Zacharias sees is the golden menorah it is made of pure gold. It has seven branches, seven pipes leading up to the seven lamps and the seven bowls so that the oil can uh, supply the lamp. And uh, this is, was part of the uh, Solomon's temple. You know, you had uh, the golden altar where they bring the sacred incense and put it uh, on the golden altar, and the prayers would go straight up into heaven. You had the golden shoe bread table where they made 12 fresh loaves of bread every day, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and so that the priests could come in and commune with God every day, fresh word every day. Oh, I could preach right there. And then you have the golden menorah, uh, and it was, of course, the seven lamps, and the seven spirits of God, which are mentioned in the book of Revelation, which, would re, which represent the seven churches of Asia Minor, which if you study the seven churches, by the way, and my dad actually studied this out and, um, and showed me that each church uh, could be seen today in seven different denominations of Christianity. You can put them all into seven categories, and you'll cover them all. Jack Van Impey also taught that it could be the seven churches, could be the seven different dispensations of the church, 
how the church historically has gone through uh, these different phases and that we're right now in the sixth and seventh phase. They're riding along together. The church of Laodicea or the church of the whore and the church of Philadelphia, the church of the bride, and those two are riding right along beside each other and are going to be separated in the last day. Okay, that's the teaching of Dr. Jack Van Impey. So I think my dad, Charles Begley, had a great revelation on that, and uh, I think Dr. Jack Van Impey had a great revelation as well. But also, this seven concept is way before we get to Revelation. It, God had to work through the Old Testament to the Jewish people and through the law and the prophets to get us to Christ, and a lot of these prophecies are still not fulfilled today. Let me read on here. So you got these two olive trees. So he sees the menorah, but then he sees two other olive branches, two olive trees standing on the outside of the menorah. And the, these three golden things I just mentioned, those are all in what's called the holies inside the uh, uh, temple of the Lord. And inside the holy of holies, you have the ark of the covenant of God, which inside the ark of the covenant, you have three things. The word of God, the tablets of stone written by God's fiery finger uh, given to uh, Moses on Mount Sinai. You have a golden bowl that holds the fresh bread and manna from heaven that fed the children of Israel every day. And you have Aaron's staff, his rod, which budded, bringing us the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And it's the same staff he used when, when plagues would hit the children of Israel. He would run out ahead of it and put his staff down to stop the plagues. This represents also a trinity. You have three in one, all in the Holy of Holies, which was on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And that's why God says, Mount Zion, my holy mountain. And well, Mount Zion is actually that ridge that runs all the way even where what's called uh, the Temple Mount is. That's all part of Mount Zion in Jerusalem. So, all right, giving you a, setting the stage for you. Why is these two olive branches or olive trees so important? So I answered, Zechariah said, and I spake to the angel that talked with me saying, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, knowest thou not what these be? And I said, no, my Lord. And he said and answered, and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace, unto it. <laughs> Are you serious? What's going on? And what God is saying is, okay, uh, Zechariah, you understand the law and the prophets. You understand the menorah. But do you understand the two witnesses that will be coming in the last days who will be bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ even in Jerusalem itself, preaching in sackcloth and ashes, that this is not by your might. This anointing is not by your might nor by your power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. You know, the preaching of the gospel is not done by the enticing words of men's wisdom, but by and through the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. Sometimes a couple of weeks ago when we played that show uh, where I was preaching, that's different than what I'm doing right now, teaching. Uh, I'm in a teaching anointing right now, uh, and on the verge of a preaching anointing, but uh, when the preacher anointing comes, then uh, the angel from heaven that carries the everlasting gospel shows up on the scene, and it's another ma major manifestation of the power of God. It's not by my might, I can tell you that right now, nor by my power, but it's by the Spirit, thus saith the Lord. But notice what he says here. I'm going to bring a word on my great mountain, okay, the, where the temple mount was. Where the, where the temple was. I'm going to bring my anointing. And as it comes, uh, I'm bringing with me the headstone. What? The cornerstone. The hewn stone. The stone that the builders rejected. That's become the head of the corner. 
Jesus Christ. So what he's saying is, okay, right now you're worshiping me with the seven branches of the menorah. But Zechariah, I want to show you that I'm sending some two witnesses soon, and they're going to be standing next to the, in other words, these witnesses are going to be in concert with God's people. Let me say this to those of you who preach, uh, be careful about preaching replacement theology of Israel, because I'm telling you, 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 I love you, brother and sister out there, but the Lord wants you to understand that it, we, the church, the, the Jews don't have to be grafted into us the Bible says we got to be grafted in to the natural branch through Jesus Christ. And then you got to leave Israel and that whole situation alone, okay? Because God's ways are not our ways. God's got that figured out. Paul told you all of Israel shall be saved. Let's just have a little faith and believe the word. But here's the deal. So it's going to have to be a combination. That's why Christians and Jews have to work together because the persecution that's going to come against us is going to be great. And I can prove it to you in the Bible. It's all through the Bible, especially in the New Testament. From the early church to the Latter-day Church, we're going to face persecution, opposition, and, uh, uh, and, and, and there will be uh, attacks on us. But we've got the power in the name of Jesus Christ. And the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, has anybody else been more persecuted in the history of the world? Yet they are still alive. And God made a nation out of nothing. He, bore, he birthed a nation in one day, just like he said he would. He brought the dry bones out of the valley of dry bones. He, they stood on their feet. He made a nation. Uh, he spoke it into existence. And it's there today to welcome the return of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, let me just say something right now. Oh, my, I'm getting preaching started. But look what he said. The head of the headstone, that's Jesus. And what does Jesus bring? He comes with shouting, saying, grace, grace. You see, until Christ came, we, they were living under the law. But when Jesus came, he brought the grace, grace. All right? The grace, grace. Oh, that could be a song. The grace, grace. That could, we could do that right there, and uh, they could be singing a little song, and they could come up to this point, and all of a sudden, grace, grace. Woo, glory. Listen, I, 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 look, do I got more time left in this show? I, I've lost track. Uh, okay. Um, so, <laughs> uh, you know something? These two olive branches, and let me tell you one more thing. When you go to Israel, you can go up on the Mount of Olives, walk down and go into the Garden of Gethsemane. There's a bunch of old olive trees down in the garden near that rock where Jesus prayed. And there's two of the trees, only two of them, are over 2,000 years old. Two olive trees. Two olive trees. They, are they the physical two witnesses? They saw Jesus the first time he was in that garden. Are they going to see him the second time? And who are the two witnesses? Some would say it's Elijah. Some would say it's Moses. Some would say it's Enoch. Well, one thing's for sure. There's, a, uh, there's some possibilities there. But God has this just like John the Baptist who came in the spirit of Elijah it was John sent by God, but he had the anointing of Elijah. These two witnesses will have the anointing upon them. I'll share with you who I think they are, and, uh, but God knows exactly who they are. We'll be right back in a few moments with more teaching on this. I'm telling you, we're living in the last days, and I think it's time to start preparing people for the two olive branches, the two olive trees, and the two witnesses, and the time we're in. I'll be right back. Every year we see records for hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires, volcanoes, and floods. Is Earth spiraling toward human extinction? extinction. Our Climate Chaos webinar Climate examines chaos. all these alarming trends, why they're increasing, and what we can do about them. Plus, Paul Begley explains their end time significance. Now you can have the entire Climate Chaos webinar on DVD so you can explore the facts in more detail. Go to paulbegleyprophecy.com to order Climate Chaos on Climate DVD. Chaos. All right, all right. Okay, I'm, I'm telling you, this is getting gooder and gooder. What? Uh, look what it says here in verse 8. I love it. In verse 7, grace, grace. But in verse 8, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. 
his hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. Now, this is really, really important. When the children of Israel were in bondage 70 years, it was Daniel who was carried away into Babylon, and Daniel got to leave. So he saw the whole 70 years, and God promoted him and blessed him and blessed him and highly favored him uh, and unbelievable. But he was, he was also persecuted, but he came out on top. Now get this. When it came time to let him go, God had already spoke a prophecy by Jeremiah that, the, that the, my people, because of their pagan worship, will be in bondage 70 years. So when it came to 70th year, Daniel reminded the Lord, and said, hey, the 70 years has happened. I've been here for the whole thing. It's time to let us go. And so the Lord spoke to the Persian king, Cyrus. And the Cyrus said, I am going to release the Jews back to Jerusalem so they can rebuild the temple of the Lord. That's what he says. And he says it in Isaiah 45. Okay, so Trump comes along. He's president, 45, just so happened. And what's he do? He, he, he does what no other president would do, move the embassy to Jerusalem on the 70th anniversary of Israel, a nation. Interesting, isn't it? But we're not done there. He also says they can go build the temple. Well, uh, Cyrus did the same thing, go and build the temple. And uh, so it's Zerubbabel who then lays the foundation of this house with his hands but he shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. And so we're right in this period again. We're seeing a replay. And how's this gonna wind up? God only knows. Uh, but we're gonna keep a close eye on it. And it says here in verse 10, for who, shall, who, for who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the land of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. So now we have the seven eyes, which is later called, of course, the seven candlestick or the seven spirits of God, the seven churches, the seven pipes of the menorah. We know this. Then answered I and said unto him, what are these two olive trees? What are they about? Upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left thereof. And I answered again and said unto him, what be these two olive branches, which through the two golden, that which though through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, knowest thou not what these be? And I said, no, my Lord. And he says this, then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. This is the prophecy of the two witnesses that will come and stand on either side of the menorah. Now, I'm going I'm I'm to blow your mind right here. But the menorah is already in Jerusalem. They've, re, they've remade it. It's made of solid, pure gold. It's about as tall as I am. It's about six foot tall with seven branches. Solid gold. I don't know how many million dollars it's worth. And they brought it out and they set it on Mount Zion. Okay? So it there, and I've walked up to it many, many times, took pictures, and there it is in a bulletproof glass case that nobody can move. All right? Now, when the third temple's built, the Temple Institute says that menorah will be moved and put in once again into the holies. So they're going to take it and move it again. To move it, it it's so heavy that it took like, uh, it took I don't know how many people and, sh and, and carts to move this thing. The streets of Jerusalem are very narrow in the old city. Now, what this says is, what I'm saying is, they're going to rebuild that temple. And when they do, that menorah is going to be back where it was at before. So these two witnesses are going to come and stand on either side again of the temple of God, but they're preaching Yeshua. They're preaching Jesus of Nazareth. They're preaching the son of the living God. They're standing with the Lord and the, of, of the whole earth. Now, go with me to Revelation 11. I've got to hurry. And it says here, 
uh, in verse one, and there was given me reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months, or three and a half years. That's how long these two witnesses will be preaching. This is how. Uh, this is right when the, before the Antichrist walks in to the third temple. And look at verse three. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. So this means they show up after 42 months and then they also, okay, so they're preaching, for, uh, I mean, excuse me, they, they, they show up when the temple is built, they preach for 42 months or for 1,203 score days, which is 1,260 days, which on the calendar, the Hebraic calendar, God's calendar is actually a 360 days a year where instead of the Gregorian calendar, which we have, which is 365. So if you take the original Hebrew calendar, it's 360 times, uh, and there you'll get your three and a half years. So now, these are the two olive trees, the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. That's the same thing he said in Malachi, I mean in Zechariah. These are my two witnesses that stand with the Lord of the earth. Verse four, these are the two olive trees. This is what Zechariah said. And there are the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And they stand on either side of the menorah. So they're standing in in Jerusalem. They're standing at the holy mountain. They're preaching in the streets. And I already told you it was up there. And if any man will hurt them, fire will proceed out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. So just like Elijah stopped the rain for three and a half years, these two witnesses will pray and stop the rain for three and a half years again. So the spirit of Elijah is absolutely on one of these witnesses. There's no other way around that one. I mean, he is absolutely everywhere. And oh, by the way, when Jesus stood on the Mount of Transfiguration, Guess who two witnesses stood with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? Elijah and Moses, the law and the prophets, standing with the Son of the living God. Now, who also could send plagues on the earth? Moses himself, the ten plagues of Egypt, turning the water into blood, sending the lice and the flies and the frogs and the locusts and the darkness and, and, and the hailstorms. So you got Elijah who could stop the rain for three and a half years and Moses who sends the plagues upon the earth. And so I think you pretty well can figure it out. Now, Enoch is always brought up because he, he was translated and the Bible says it's once appointed men to die after this, but he's not the only person that, that uh, was carried away, okay? We know that the Bible says 500 uh, bodies of the saints, but they died and then we rose again. They got, it's a great point that maybe Enoch gets, uh, gets a part of this, but I really think it's gotta be these two. It doesn't matter, God knows. Now, it won't change a thing whether I'm right or wrong, but let me show you what else it says. They have power to shut the heavens that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with other plagues as often they will, okay? Pretty easy. And then verse seven, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. What? Why? Well, their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city, which is Jerusalem, but is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt because of the sin that's being committed even at that time, where also our Lord was crucified. Folks, I tell you what, we're going to get the rest of the story when I come back, right here on The Coming Apocalypse.
right, all right. Now, guys, go with me. Stay in Revelation chapter 11. Let's go right back here and look what it says in verse 9. It says, And they of the people and kindred and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in the graves. So not only will these guys preach for three and a half years, send plagues on the earth, stop the rain, and, 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 be, and people, assassins from different countries, will try to kill them, but then they're going to be killed finally when the Antichrist arrives and takes his seat of authority in the holy place. And we know that by 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Boy, if I had an hour, I could really break this down for you. But anyway, let me, let me, let me move on. They kick their bodies around in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days, and they won't put them in the graves. It's an insult. It's, it's blasphemous what they're doing to these preachers. And they that dwell on the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. So the, the leaders of the world are celebrating, sending gifts. We finally killed those preachers, finally got them. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life <laughs> from God entered into them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. What? That's going to wake up CNN uh, when, <laughs> or anybody else that's over there with their cameras. YouTube, everybody's going to be freaking out when these guys wake up from the dead. All right. And I heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. Here we go. I'm going to rapture you right now. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. Are you serious? Are you seriously serious? And then a great earthquake comes and, and, the, and everything gets chaotic. I'm here to tell you right now. The Antichrist gets defeated. Jesus Christ comes. Zechariah 14. We can tell you all about it. I want to know, are you ready to meet the Lord? Are you ready to give your life to Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I know you're sending the two witnesses. Lord, I know that you've already, your gospel is going out to the world. Even on this broadcast, we're preaching the word of God to a world that needs Jesus. And so, Lord, help us to forgive us of our sins, Lord. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Lord, I want to make it to heaven. I want to hear you call my name and ascend into heaven to be with Jesus of Nazareth. Lord, save me, wash me, and fill me with the fire and the power of God. I confess, I repent in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Oh, thank God. I mean, whoo, glory. Are you serious? You better not miss next week, all right, on the coming apocalypse.